Okay, thank you very much. So, is this working? Can you? Yeah? Okay, good. Um, okay, so uh, this is my, my title, and um, uh, ostensibly it doesn't, uh, it doesn't have much to do with uh, Poisson geometry, but I hope as we, as we go through, you'll see a number of common themes there. Indeed, some of the themes have been represented in the previous talks. So let me begin by, uh, by telling you what, uh, what this is. So it's a, I hate to say it, but it's a kind of generalization of generalized geometry, but uh, it's just an unfortunate uh, terminology which has now stuck. But I just want to remind you briefly, and this is related of course to Gilles' talk yesterday, of what, uh, what we would call uh, conventional generalized geometry. Uh, this is where you take a manifold and you think of uh, the tangent bundle plus the cotangent bundle as a replacement for the tangent bundle. It has this indefinite inner product on it, uh, which gives it the structure group of, uh, of the Lie group S O N N. So, if you like, you could call this. Uh, so, this is Lie type D N. You could call this D N uh, generalized geometry. I mean, you have a bundle, which is thought of as a tangent bundle, and it has a, an inner product, which is this S O N N structure. So, um, what I'm going to talk about is the. Uh, a simple extension of this, which is you go from the uh, even dimensional orthogonal group to the odd dimensional orthogonal group. So that's what the type BN means. And what it means is that you, uh, you think of uh, extending the tangent bundle by the tangent bundle plus the cotangent bundle plus the trivial bundle. And so this has a natural inner product on it of signature n plus 1n. It's just the uh, this the one which came from uh, generalized geometry, the contraction of uh, tangent vectors with uh, one forms, and then you add on this uh, uh, lambda squared term for the, the scalar in the middle. And uh, so really what I want to do is to, uh, if you like, uh, just look at this and uh, do the sort of things that we, we do in generalized geometry uh, and turn the handle and see what you get. So I should say that the, the idea of doing this is due to my former student David Borrelia uh, in this, uh, this paper here. And he was largely motivated by the work of the physicists Chris Hull and others on using exceptional groups to replace uh, uh, what the physicists would call ODD, but it's S O N N. Uh, so, there's, in a sense, it, so it's briefly mentioned. This BN geometry is briefly mentioned in Borelli's paper as a kind of toy example, and then he goes on to more sophisticatedly groups. But I always feel that you can learn something just step by step by doing. A first generalization and then, then seeing what you get before you go to the, the full picture. Uh, and I should say that actually uh, David's uh, coll collaborator, I guess, in Canberra, Peter Bauknecht, uh, uh, mentioned these, this type of geometry briefly in his uh, talk last year at the String Math Conference. So what I'm going to talk about today is, is really uh, really the work I'm doing with my uh, student, uh, Roberto Rubio, and it's had some uh, input from a postdoc, uh, Mario Garcia Fernandez, who's working on um, what's called the Strominger system and trying to reformulate it in terms of generalized geometry. Anyway, uh, so let me uh, begin by just going fairly briefly through the features which are completely parallel to those in ordinary generalized geometry. Uh, I'll point out a few minor differences and then I want to talk about three issues which are, which are different in this, in this geometry. So uh, if you break up, so uh, we're thinking of T plus 1 plus T star as having this, uh, this orthogonal structure. If you look at the, uh, the skewer joint endomorphisms, the Lie algebra of this orthogonal group, then it breaks up this way. Um, actually, is there, a, is there a pointer? Is this? Uh, okay. Which one? The middle one. Ah, oh, that's right. Um, okay, so, so the new feature here, okay, so it's not, not a big deal, is that when you break it up this way, so you have uh, two forms acting as skewer joint endomorphisms, but you also have one forms. So we're going to call these things, uh, so you have what are called A fields and B fields. So the B field, the, the two form, was present and important in generalized geometry. Here you have a, an A field as well, you have a one form and a two form. 
And how do they act? So this is the, the algebra, oh no, well this is actually the exponentiation of the action. Uh, so this is an orthogonal action on t plus 1 plus t star. Uh, the A field, the one form, acts uh, in this way, so it leaves the, the vector field and the tangent vector unchanged. The scalar, it changes by the contraction of the A with the tangent vector. And then the, the, the one form changes by, the interesting thing is this, we have a, a mildly nonlinear uh, uh, part here. Which, so that's, that wasn't present in the, in the ordinary B field action. So this is the standard B field action, which is linear in B. So I should say this is exponentiation from uh, the orthogonal the Lie algebra there. And so you can, what you can say is that the, um, so the product of, uh, if you think of A and B as sitting inside here, and you exponentiate the action on the tangent, uh, on vectors, then uh, the, uh, the composition of this action uh, operates this way. So again, it's, uh, it has this quadratic term here, which was not present before. So that's the action of something in the Lie algebra, in particular the A field and the B field, on vectors. So we think of vectors as t plus 1 plus t star. These are vectors for the uh, rep vector representation, if you like, of this orthogonal group. Uh, now, as we learned, we learned long ago that uh, you have to regard ex the exterior forms uh, in this picture as spinners for the orthogonal group. And here the action is, so, and the reason for doing so is that uh, they are a module under the uh, uh, Clifford module, under the action of uh, t plus 1 plus t star here. Uh, again, the, the issue to notice here is that we have scalars, we have these lambdas in the, in the vectors, in t plus 1 plus t star, how do they act on spinners? Well, they don't act quite as scalars. They act, uh, we have this parity operator here according to the degree of the form. So, so it acts as scalar times, I've called it tor here. So tor is plus one on even forms and minus one on odd forms. Of course, this is a, a spin representation of an odd dimensional orthogonal group. So there's no, no invariant to even part and odd part as we have in the even, in the even uh, case. And this is the action, so this is the standard action of a, a two form. The B field action is exponentiating the B as a two form. And the, one, the A field acts in a fairly simple way. It's just, it's just this, uh, this. So that's the, that's the way A fields and B fields act in, in the spin representation. And now you can say, well, what are the automorphisms of this, uh, this type of geometry? And so you call this, this is a group here, the group of generalized diffeomorphisms, which is a semi-direct product of the diffeomorphisms of the manifold by what I call omega 2 plus 1. So this is the, these are the closed forms, closed A fields and B fields, uh, but they have a product here, of course the product respects the closure condition. And so the, uh, uh, what we have is this, this extended uh, part of the diffeomorphism group, has the structure of a central extension, so we, the, we have the map to the closed A form part and the kernel is, is the B form part. But of course it, it's not a product because of this, uh, this quadratic uh, factor. So that's the situation, so we think of uh, some geometry defined naturally in terms of the Lie group SON plus 1N, we think of generalized automorphisms, and, uh, and we, we try and see what happens. Uh, well actually there's a, a little bit more to be uh, dealt with here, that uh, in particular if I have a, a, generalized, so a generalized vector field, is going to be a section of this generalized tangent bundle, T plus the trivial bundle plus the cotangent bundle, so it's a vector field plus a function plus a one form. And a generalized vector field defines something in the Lie algebra of the generalized diffeomorphisms. Uh, so here's our closed one form, here's our closed two form. And uh, because of this, you can in fact on any representation of SOM plus 1N, you can realize uh, an action uh, of, the, uh, of, this, of the generalized vector field. So you go first of all into the Lie algebra of this, uh, this group. Uh, any representation of SON plus 1N breaks down, because of uh, the way we've done it, into uh, some 
sum of tensors, so the, the vector field acts by the ordinary Lie derivative on tensors, and the one form and the two form act according to how they sit inside the Lie algebra of SO n plus 1 n. So we take a generalized vector field, we take this image in this Lie algebra, we integrate it, well let's, let's do it infinitesimally here, so we take the Lie derivative, so we call the Lie derivative the action of this, and uh, in particular if you look at the action on vectors, then that defines a kind of Dorfman bracket, I won't say, uh, won't spell it out, and if you look at the action on spinners, then it's a, it's a nice formula. It's like the Cartan formula, but in, it involves uh, Clifford multiplication instead of uh, exterior multiplication. Now, if you skew symmetrize the action, uh, this Dorfman action on here, then what you, what you get is a, a current bracket. And uh, so I, I still insist on using uh, the words current bracket for the skew symmetric one, although I know other people uh, call what I would call the Dorfman bracket the current bracket. Anyway, uh, and this satisfies all the axioms of a, of a current bracket. So I should say that uh, these, this type of, uh, of current algebroid is considered in this, in this paper, uh, possibly in other places too. So that's, that's a brief uh, summary of what happens, uh, what the basic uh, methods and constituent objects are in analyzing problems with this geometry. So, so the question is, what's, what's new? Um, so I want to, I mean, there are all sorts of things which might be there, but I want to just focus on, on three, um, which each, uh, in a way, have their analog in uh, generalized geometry, but there are new features. So, uh, first of all, I, I want to talk about uh, what I call G22 structures, which again was originally suggested by David Boravia. Uh, then I want to talk about how you twist one of these uh, structures. And finally, I want to talk about generalized connections, uh, torsion, and curvature in this, this context. So first, uh, let, me, let me talk about G22 manifold. So this G22 is the, uh, the non-compact real form of the exceptional group G2. And it sits inside uh, SO43, uh, which of course is of type SON plus 1N. So you can ask yourself, what, is the, what kind of structure does a 3-manifold have? Uh, if we have a reduction of the structure group of this generalized tangent bundle from SO43 down to G22. Well, G22 is, well, G2 in general, well, how should I put it? The, the G2 that most of us are probably familiar with, the compact G2, is the stabilizer of a spinner in seven dimensions. Uh, in the indefinite signature case, there are, different, there are two different types of spinners. The spin space is eight dimensional and it has a quadratic form on it and there are only two different types. There's a, a non-null spinner or a null spinner. The null spinners are the, uh, the pure spinners in this case. So this group G22 is the stabilizer of a non-null spinner. What does that mean when we represent spinners as exterior forms? It means that we're on a three manifold, that we have uh, a form with all possible degrees, and the quadratic form is this Mokai pairing, or Chevalet pairing, as uh, Gilles called it. And uh, so non-null means that it's, uh, it's not equal to zero. So, uh, so what is the definition here then of a G22 manifold? Is a, a three manifold together with uh, a closed, for closed form. So we're going to impose some integrability condition. A closed form rho, uh, such that this rho rho is not equal to zero everywhere. So this is now a three form, and we want it to be non-zero everywhere. So in some respects, this is like uh, doing symplectic geometry in three dimensions. You have a closed form, which has some non-degeneracy condition, uh, and you want to understand the geometry of it. Um, so, but before I go on, let me just point out one thing, since this is a conference, it's called Poisson anyway, that there is a Poisson structure uh, on any one of these G22 manifolds, because basically you have the, you have the closed one form, row one, we also have this non-vanishing uh, volume form, 
and so you can define the Poisson bracket like that and it's integrable because this row one is closed uh, but uh, it really doesn't pay any, play any, any role in what I'm going to say uh, although maybe somebody out there has some, some ideas about that so, uh, so what can you say about this? You can say, well, okay, what, what three manifolds have such a structure? And uh, it's pretty easy to see that any oriented uh, three manifold does, because you could just take uh, rho to be like, look like this. So, constant scalar, non-zero, one, and a volume form, because the uh, rho bracket, rho, uh, inner product of rho with itself is then just the, the volume form. And volume form, by definition, is non-vanishing at each point. And closed, because it's a top degree form. It's more interesting if you, if you suppose that the degree zero part is zero, because then you have a, a non-vanishing, in particular you have a non-vanishing closed one form. And so what we know is that uh, such a, a one form, imply, the existence of such a one form, implies that the three manifold fibers over the circle. So you can approximate row one by a form with rational periods, and then, uh, and then multiply it by a large integer and you'll get a, a one form with integral periods and that will define a map to the circle. So there is a, a constraint then, that not all three manifolds fiber over a circle and so, um, so not every uh, three manifold actually has such a structure with row zero uh, equal to zero. Um, if we look at this case here, suppose we don't have a row 3, actually the row 3, if row 0 is equal to 0, row 3 doesn't play a big role, but uh, the picture that you have here is that uh, in this situation you have, there's a unique vector field which uh, is in the kernel of row 2, and it's like a rabe vector field I guess, evaluated on row 1 is equal to 1, and what that means is that uh, if you're in the situation where row 1 is, the pullback of a basic one form on the circle, then this row two is, uh, gives you a symplectic form on the fiber, which is, okay, the lead derivative is equal to zero by this vector field x. So once you integrate that, you see that you're constructing your three form as the mapping torus of a symplectic diffeomorphism of a surface. So if you, if you look at it from that point of view, then it's, it's a fairly simple, uh, Object. On the other hand, if it's if you just think of it as a, a, a three manifold, then of course there are lots of different ways possibly of fibering over a circle. So if you think of this as being analogous to symplectic geometry, then there are two obvious questions. Uh, the first is, well, is the how should I put it? Is the modulus locally determined by the cohomology class. I'll put it this way, if, if we have two such closed forms which are in the same cohomology class and if they are sufficiently close, are they equivalent under a generalized diffeomorphism? So we know in symplectic geometry this is the uh, I guess the Moses theorem, or, I mean version of the Darboux theorem I suppose, that if you have uh, two symplectic forms in the same cohomology class, and if the symplectic forms are close enough, then actually they are diffeomorphic. In this situation, we have to use uh, the most obvious things to use are not diffeomorphisms, but generalized diffeomorphisms. Uh, the second one is, uh, is in principle more, uh, more difficult to assess because this is the, the question in symplectic geometry of what is the symplectic cone. What are the cohomology classes which actually represent symplectic forms? And so we can ask the same question here, which cohomology classes on a three manifold actually contain these, uh, these structures? So let me, let me look at the first one. So the first, uh, the first situation is actually uh, quite straightforward because you can imitate the Moser argument. Uh, so very briefly, so what do you do? So let me just remind you that in uh, the argument with symplectic manifolds is that you say uh, the two symplectic forms differ by d of a one form and then you interpolate between the two forms linearly 
and then that one form defines a vector field, a time-dependent vector field, and you integrate that vector field, and that gives you the diffeomorphism, uh, uh, which takes one to the other. So that's the, the strategy which, uh, which works here. So we have our two forms here, row prime and row. They differ by, they're in the same cohomology class, they differ by d of a form. You look at this interpolation, t equals zero gives us rho, t equals one gives us rho primed. And then, now what we need is a, a generalized vector field ut, such that the Clifford product with rho t is equal to, well, minus phi. And then the idea is to uh, integrate that to a generalized diffeomorphism. And that kind of integration is, is fairly easy to, to do. You integrate the vector field to a one-parameter family of diffeomorphisms, and then getting the, the A fields and the B fields is, is a genuine integration. You, you pull back the, the forms and do an integration. So, but I don't want to go into that. So you can integrate uh, generalized vector fields into generalized diffeomorphisms. But there's, there's one uh, little problem here, and that is that, uh, that this is a, lies in a rank 7 uh, vector bundle, 3 plus 1 plus 3, Whereas the forms, uh, are, this is an eight-dimensional space, right? uh, so the spin representation, SO43, is eight-dimensional. So there's no way in which you can actually, uh, uh, I mean, it's, we're not quite in the situation where this is a, the row gives an isomorphism between one and the other. On the other hand, um, this, this uh, alpha here, this, sorry, phi, is, uh, I mean, I can always add on a closed form to phi, and in particular I could add on a three form, because any three form on a three manifold is closed, and so that really uh, uh, doesn't make, makes it, makes it work. Oh, well, in this particular situation, actually, we could, we could just take alpha to be a, have degrees only up to two, which is a seven-dimensional space, and then uh, when rho zero is not equal to zero, then there's an algebraic argument which says that this actually is invertible. If you project onto the, the parts of degree less than three, then that's, uh, that projection from a seven-dimensional space to a seven-dimensional space is actually invertible. So when rho zero is not equal to zero, you have this invertibility and you can imitate directly the Moser argument. When rho zero is equal to zero, uh, it's a little bit more complicated. Uh, so, if you assume first of all that rho one is the pullback from a map to the circle of a standard one form, then uh, what you've got to do is to uh, you, you've got to find a, a, a phi such that it's in the image of this. So it's orthogonal, if you like, to this to the row that you're at. Uh, because that's so the image of this uh, of this map. So we're fixing rho and we're mapping u into the forms. The image of this is the ones uh, the forms for which this this pairing is equal to zero. So what you've got to do is to is to modify your phi by a closed form in order to get it to lie in this image. So the first thing you can do is to look at the cohomology class of this top degree form here. And you can make that trivial simply by uh, changing phi 2 by a constant multiple of rho 2. So rho 2 is closed, uh, and rho 1 wedge rho 2 is non-zero, so rho 1 wedge rho 2 has a non-trivial degree 3 cohomology class. So you can choose that to make this, first of all, to make this exact, and then you get an alpha there. And uh, then what you can do is to take this form alpha, so this 2 form, integrate over the fibers and you'll pick up a function on the base and then when you subtract off some multiple of this row 2 along the fibers that's uh, cohomologous to, to zero so it's uh, globally it's d of some, uh, some form plus something which vanishes on the fibers like this. So once you've got that and you look at d alpha and then you'll see that it's, uh, it looks like this and so by, if you like, adding on df to, to phi 1, that's a closed form to phi 1, and d gamma to phi 2, you can kill this d alpha, get it into the image, and come back again. 
so that's all right for this uh, this situation, but uh, but on the other hand, what we're looking at is a, a generic issue. We're looking at surjectivity of a certain map, and by perturbing uh, by perturbing uh, slightly again uh, from this situation, you get it for the general one. So so the, the net result is that actually this. This cohomology cast actually does determine the, the structure up to a generalized diffeomorphism if, uh, if these two are, are, are close enough. Uh, what about the second part? So this is the part which is uh, you know, notoriously difficult in, in general, even in four, four manifolds. I mean, what is the symplectic cone on a simply connected four-dimensional symplectic manifold? That's a very difficult question. Uh, and it's, it's only known for a few, a few four manifolds. But fortunately, when you go down to three dimensions, uh, this question is, uh, is easier to answer. In particular, again, when rho zero is not equal to zero, then you can use uh, rho one over rho zero as an A field, and rho two over rho zero as a B field. And you can transform any, uh, any such structure into one which looks like a scalar plus a volume form. So uh, if you take the corresponding cohomology classes, so if you take a cohomology class which satisfies the non-degeneracy condition that the the row-row cohomology class is non-zero, then actually you can, if you take representative forms in there and then uh, change, well, Basically, it's, it's equivalent to the, the, the trivial solution here, 1 plus, uh, plus the volume form. If you go backwards uh, under this transformation here, then you, you get to, you get to, to realize that cohomology class by, by G22 structure. Uh, but the situation of rho zero equals zero is much more difficult, but fortunately, many years ago, uh, there was an answer given to this by Thurston, so the, the, the key issue when rho zero is equal to zero is which classes in the first cohomology are represented by non-vanishing one forms. And uh, the answer is expressed in terms of the, the first and norm. I don't want to go into this, but it's, it's, a, it's a norm on H1 uh, determined, uh, and so on the fibred classes, when you, uh, when you actually have a map to the circle, you look at the... Uh, you look at basically the Euler characteristic of the fiber, and you look at the minimum value of the absolute value of the Euler characteristic of the of generic fiber. And uh, anyway, that gives you a norm. And uh, uh, one of the results of first then was that the uh, the cohomology classes of non-vanishing one forms are given by co the cone on certain faces of this unit ball, and certain faces. Uh, I'm told by three manifold theorists is that given a three manifold you can usually compute what the what these these faces are so uh, so unfortunately in this three dimensional situation uh, both of these uh, questions have uh, a reasonable reasonable answer now what else can you say about these g22 structures uh, there's not much I, else I can say you can start talking about metric structures related to these but uh, but there, in a way, it's not a very sophisticated object, but it is, uh, it is a, a kind of this is symplectic geometry in a generalized sense, uh, operating on, on a three-dimensional manifold. So let me go on to the, the, next, uh, the next question, and this is one uh, with regard to twisting these, these structures. So we're now in arbitrary dimensions. And so let me <coughs> remind you about what happens in ordinary or DN generalized geometry uh, about one approach to twisting these things. So uh, I like to think of it this way, that you, you patch together copies of T plus T star by a, a co-cycle of closed uh, two forms. So, so you twist this way. So you have a, over open sets U and V on your manifold you take a copy of T plus T star in each and you identify them on the intersection by a B field, by a closed two form defined on the intersection. And in order to be, uh, to have a compatible identification, uh, that, uh, that two form has to satisfy a co-cycle condition, in this case in the group uh, of closed two forms. Uh, and what, what you get that way, if you do that, is you get a current algebroid 
So instead of becoming a direct sum, it now becomes an extension, and this is the and because the two form preserves the current bracket and the orthogonal structure, this uh, this e this total space e retains that uh, that structure. So it is a, a current algebra. So in Bn generalized geometry, we can do the same thing. So we take uh, t plus one plus t star on open sets. And we identify by a one co-cycle in this, this group here, so A fields and B fields. And what you get is a, is a current algebra. Uh, what its structure is, is that if you, if you look at the quotient by the, the T star sitting inside here, you get a rank N plus 1 bundle, which has a Lie algebra structure. Uh, in, in fact, it looks, looks, it looks like the, if you like, the Atia algebra of uh, a principal circle bundle. So it's just a, an extension of the tangent bundle by the trivial bundle. But this is a, an ordinary Lie algebra with a, a bracket on its sections, which uh, satisfies the Jacobi identity. So that's the, that's the structure of this, this type of uh, current algebra. Um, but now you might ask, well, uh, uh, topologically, what is this uh, classified by? Uh, so we want to understand the, the cohomology class. So we've got a, a co-cycle here. We want to, uh, want to understand the, the cohomology class here. So the, the line under, underneath this means the, the sheaf of, uh, of closed forms of this, this particular type. And what is this H1? So this is actually a non-abelian group. So this H1 is not, not quite a group, really. It's really a set. But because this is a central extension, then you can, you can go a certain distance down the long exact sequence. Uh, in, in particular, you can, go, you can go this far. So we want to classify uh, these, this type of object. Uh, so we're looking for something in here. And this fits into this exact sequence here. So, what have we got here? We've got H1 of the uh, the sheaf of closed one forms. Well, this is easily seems to be isomorphic to the Durham cohomology H2. Uh, this is uh, this H22 is isomorphic to H4. And the the map here, this uh, connecting homomorphism, is actually the squaring map. So you have a class here, and you square it and you get a class here. So uh, the object we're looking for here, it, gives, it defines me a degree 2 cohomology class whose square is 0, and uh, any, any two of these differ by something which comes, which differs by a degree 3 cohomology class. So uh, one way of putting that in more concrete fashion is to do some splittings and, uh, or if you like, to represent these uh, classes by forms. And what it means is that we're basically looking at the situation here that we, if you represent this by uh, a, a closed form f, and then to say that f squared is, uh, is, is trivial as a cohomology class says that f squared is d of a, of a three form, in this case, I want to write this as minus d of h. And any two such choices differ by a closed three form whose cohomology class lies inside here. So this is maybe the most, most con concrete way of looking at it. This is the more invariant way of looking at what these twistings are. This involves choices. This is, uh, up here is more general. So, uh, okay, so what can you do when you, when you do a twist like this? Um, well, you can, uh, you can look at what you do with spinners. So instead of patching together the vector representation of SON plus 1N and getting this current algebra, you can patch together the spin representation. And uh, uh, this, is the, this is what the patching function is. And what you get there is, uh, you can call it a spinner bundle S, and uh, this so this, uh, this commutes with the exterior differential. So here, I mean, so obviously, so B is a closed two form, so that commutes with D. A is, of course, a closed one form, so that anti-commutes with D, but we've, we're multiplying it by this tor, this uh, minus one to the degree, so actually the, co the composition of this with tor commutes with D. So this identification commutes with the exterior derivative, and so there is a, a, an induced operator on the on the, the spinner bundle here. 
So remember that this tour it just came very naturally from the action of this part of the Lie algebra of SO n plus 1 n on, on spinners. So, I, I mean, it, there are all sorts of other reasons which, you know, people would say that this is important to, to see there, but for me it's simply looking at the representation of SO n plus 1 n and seeing what you get. So if we think of this as a, a spin bundle, a twisted spin bundle, we have this differential operator and uh, uh, again if you split the extension, if you do what I did before, choose an F and an H, then you get a, uh, an operator which looks like this, D plus F tall plus H, going from forms to forms. So basically I've straightened out this spinner bundle S to be isomorphic to the, the forms again, and my D operator now becomes a, a different one. I'll put another way, this D operator, this operator here, is the obtained from D by conjugating with a, a non-closed A field and B field. Uh, so this and uh, the condition that uh, f squared plus dh equals zero uh, tells you that actually this squares to zero. Well, we, in a way we know it because it's in another guise it's, it's d, ordinary d. So, so here you notice uh, the difference. So if f is equal to zero, then h will be closed because dh plus f, is it plus f squared is equal to zero. And this will just be the ordinary twisted cohomology that uh, Gilles Cavalcanti was talking about in, in his talk yesterday. Uh, here we've got an, an extra term f, and uh, so there's an obvious question here, which is, what is this cohomology? It's some kind of generalization of the ordinary twisted cohomology, where you twist with a degree 3, with, with a, a degree 3 closed form. So, <coughs> There's an answer to this in the situation where f satisfies an integrability, integrality condition. So suppose f was actually the curvature of a, um, of a U1 connection. So this is like the situation where the Lie algebroid L that I talked about earlier really was an Atiyah algebroid. Then uh, if you look at the principal bundle P, then uh, and take theta to be the connection form on P, then you see that, uh, so H, if we pull back H from M to P, then you'll see that uh, this three form on P is closed. Because, okay, so D, my, the relation is that DH plus F squared is equal to zero, that's precisely saying that this, this form is, uh, is closed. Uh, but what this means is that, um, so we do have a closed three form on the principal bundle, but it's, it's rather special in the sense that actually the principal bundle here is, is t-dual to itself. So, so what does that mean? <coughs> it means this, that suppose we look at um, invariant forms on the principal bundle, invariant under the circle action, then you can write them this way, that so alpha is invariant and pulled back from the base, and then, so alpha and beta are pulled back from the base and are therefore invariant and we write these, uh, a general uh, S1 invariant form in, in this term, in these terms, where theta is here the, the connection form. And then t-duality is the, is the transformation which uh, takes this one into, uh, into this. So it, it interchanges the roles of alpha and beta with some signs. And to say that, uh, that this principal bundle is t-dual to itself means that if you apply t to this uh, twisted differential here, then it goes into minus minus itself. So, uh, so suppose you look, look now at this, so what does that mean? So suppose it, now we look at the a term alpha plus theta tor alpha, and then you see that this is actually 1 plus theta tor of, of this operator that we're, we're looking for. So another way of saying that is that actually on the principal bundle we have this A field, theta, this one form. It's not a closed one form, but it's, it's, think of it as an A field. If we conjugate this d plus h plus theta f by the action, this is the 1 plus theta tor, the inverse is 1 minus theta tor, then we get this operator here. 
Well, we don't need to think of it that way, uh, because uh, what, what you see here is that uh, we, we can understand the cohomology of this by looking at the, this uh, D operator on the principal bundle, but restricted to classes of this type. And how do you how do you recognize classes of this type? Well, they're the fixed points of uh, an involution. So we take tor first, and then we apply. The, so we take t, sorry, the t of the t duality first. Then we apply tor, and we see we get a fixed point here. So so the result about this is is basically that uh, an all, and this tor anti commutes with t. So t squared is minus one. So what you get is an actual, actually an involution. And so what you can say is that this, uh, this what I would call HF, twisted cohomology of the manifold, is actually the invariant part of the twisted cohomology upstairs of the, of the principal bundle. So this is, uh, this is a, a kind of natural uh, situation. Uh, and uh, you, know, you all might ask the question of, uh, is there a generalization of this to twisted K theory? I mean, we know that... Uh, we know that t-duality uh, gives an isomorphism between the odd part of the twisted cohomology to the even part, um, but uh, t-duality also, uh, if you twist with the, if you have k-theory, twisted k-theory, twisted by a gerb represented by this form, then we know that uh, t-duality takes the odd part of the twisted k-theory to the even part. So, uh, and tor is just acting as, uh, as an analog of tor. It acts as zero on the even part and minus one on the odd part. So there's a there's a, a question here about it. we could do this on the principal bundle, but how do you interpret that type of twisted K theory on the uh, on the manifold itself? So that's a question which uh, I don't know the answer to. Anyway, so this is this is a new a new feature of, of this geometry that it introduces uh, a new differential uh, which generalizes the twisted differential and somehow it's related in this particular case where f is integral it's related to t-duality on the principal bundle. Okay, well, for my, uh, so for the last part I want to talk about uh, connections and torsion in this, uh, this context of uh, generalized geometry. So here, uh, so Marco Gualtieri uh, introduced these basic analogues of uh, connections and torsion in ordinary differential geometry into the generalized uh, setting, and they work uh, straightforwardly in this, uh, well in fact for any current algebraid. So in particular for this one, so my E now is, I mean if you want you can think of E as being T plus 1 plus T star, or you could think of it as being one of these twisted versions. And if I have a vector bundle W, then a generalized connection is a differential operator going from W to the tensor product of E with W, which uh, satisfies this relation. So the, uh, the derivative of F sits inside the cotangent bundle, which sits inside the current algebraid E. So what is it? Well, so as far as differentiation is concerned, it's just the ordinary derivative. So what, what it really is, is uh, you could take an ordinary connection and then just add on a section of this uh, endomorphism bundle tensor with E, and that's what a, a generalized connection would be. Uh, but still, it's, it's useful to, uh, to use the, the terminology of ordinary connections. And so, for example, you can talk about the derivative of a section of W, section S of W, in the generalized direction U, uh, simply applying this operator D and then evaluating on U. That means evaluating on the E part itself. And when you do that, you can also talk about reductions of structure group, uh, frame bundles, principal bundles, compatibility with inner products, and so forth. Uh, if you take the uh, vector bundle to be the generalized tangent bundle itself, then there comes the question of how do you generalize torsion. So in ordinary uh, differential geometry, if you have a connection on the tangent bundle, then the torsion is a question of compatibility with the, the bracket, the Lie bracket. And the most obvious uh, 
attempt to define torsion for a current algebra is to simply replace the Lie bracket with the current bracket. But that doesn't work because, as we know, the current bracket doesn't satisfy quite the same relations with regard to multiplication by a function. In particular, it picks up the derivative of the function in a different way, which messes up this. So, so there is a definition of torsion which is tensorial in this generalized geometry context which involves adding on these extra terms here. And uh, uh, so what, what we know from Gualtieri's work is that uh, if D preserves the natural inner product on the, uh, on, the, on the current algebraid, then this torsion is actually totally skew, skew symmetric. Um, okay, well, I, I mean, I've never liked that definition of torsion, to be honest. Uh, I mean, it, it's, uh, I, I prefer to think of it as compatibility with pre-existing differential operators. And there is a, a pre-existing differential operator, which is the D operator on forms. And so to say that a, a, a connection is torsion-free, uh, I prefer to say that if you take the, uh, the covariant derivative on the cotangent bundle, and then skew symmetry, so just project onto the uh, onto, the, onto the exterior algebra, then that composition, if you like, the torsion is the difference between that composition and the pre-existing differential operator D. And so, so you can do that. Uh, you can uh, do that in the uh, for a, for any one of these these structures because we have, uh, if you like, we have a, a natural differential operator on spinners. We have our that uh, the D, what I call the D operator. So this is um, I'm thinking now of before untwisting it and using the F and the H, but uh, it's the same thing. So we have this natural differential operator on spinners. So this is here I'm uh, assuming that my generalized connection preserves the orthogonal structure. And then it has an induced there's an induced generalized connection on the spin bundle. Then uh, there's an operator here. So with the connection, I can go from this to the spin bundle. Then I can follow it by Clifford multiplication and get back to the spin bundle. And this is, you know, formally speaking, you could call this a Dirac operator. But of course, it's nothing like it really, uh, because its symbol is the same as the exterior derivative. So, uh, so you could define torsion to be the compatibility, well, the the difference between this operator and the D operator. And of course, what is that difference? It's the difference is a homomorphism from spinners to spinners. So that's the same as an element of the exterior algebra of E itself. And uh, of course, and it turns out to be in, in, in wedge 3 of E. So, um, so this, is, uh, this is equivalent to the other definition, but somehow it's, uh, I find it more attractive. Um, okay, so now uh, now let me talk about uh, metrics, about Riemannian metrics. How do you introduce a Riemannian metric into this generalized geometry? Well, it's just a reduction to a maximal compact subgroup of S O N plus one N. And how do you do that? Well, again, this is just analogous to generalized geometry. It's the same thing as a rank N subbund. Well, you have a choice here. This is so. This is. Uh, if we talk about a rank n subbundle, then uh, we're looking at uh, one on which the metric is negative definite, and then its orthogonal complement is a rank n plus one on which the metric is positive definite. So, uh, uh, so as an example, if you just take an ordinary Riemannian metric G, then uh, you can then this you can define V as being uh, this part. So this doesn't doesn't meet the one part. A V perpendicular is, is, is this. So, uh, and in fact, uh, it turns out that, um, that locally, at least, uh, if, if I take something like this and I transform it by a non-closed A field and, and B field, then I get any, any generalized uh, metric. Anyway, this is a more invariant way of saying it. It's this sub, sub-bundle on which the induced inner product is negative definite. So here's, here's a problem, which is, uh, I mean, we know that in ordinary Riemannian geometry, if you have a metric, uh, then there's a unique connection, the Levi-Civita connection, which preserves the metric, 
and has zero torsion. So the question is, so can you actually find uh, a torsion-free generalized connection which preserves the, the generalized metric? So, uh, so what does that mean? So, uh, what, is it, what do we have to do? So here what I'm doing is actually following the procedure uh, in ordinary generalized geometry that was uh, followed by uh, Dan Waldrum and various collaborators. Uh, well, he includes the um, a diloton, a, there's a conformal factor, but he's rederiving certain equations uh, in physics from this, this, this more general point of view. So anyway, so what are you going to do? You're going to take this, uh, so the generalized metric gives you a decomposition of E into V plus V perpendicular. Uh, projection on the, from the current algebra to T identifies V with the tangent bundle T. And so the idea is to take a standard connection, the levi civita connection on T, and say the trivial connection on the trivial bond here, and then look for things to add on in such a way that, uh, that the torsion vanishes such that this Clifford, uh, this, this Dirac operator, if you like, is equal to, equal to D. So, so the way to do this is, so here is what, what we do. So we, I want to decompose my E now into V minus, which is this, and V zero, which is the trivial bundle, and V plus, which is this. And then use the, not the, they use the D operator, which is this uh, D plus F tor plus H. So in fact, the generalized metric gives you uh, H's and F's. It gives you splittings, which enables you to, which define natural F's and H's. So the idea then is to take the levi civita connection and add on, so you know, I said earlier that a, a connection, in a generalized connection, is an ordinary connection plus some endomorphism of the bundle tensored with E. So what we've got to, what we've got to do is to take the bundle, so the, we've got to take something which respects this decomposition because it's going to preserve the generalized metric. So it's going to have a, the terms we put on are going to have some, in terms of this block diagonal decomposition, they're going to be diagonal here, so we're going to have and preserve the metric. So it's got to be, there's a part which is skew symmetric in V minus but has coefficients in E, and there's a part which is skew symmetric in this and has coefficients in E. So we have to choose bits to add on in order to get this uh, zero torsion. Well, when you write down the ordinary derivative, the exterior derivative, uh, using the levi civita connection, which of course is torsion-free, uh, then you can write it this way. So this is the exterior multiplication by g of xi, but my x pluses, so x plus is is this, and x, x plus is this, and x minus is this. So the gxi is half of x plus uh, minus x minus, I guess. Maybe I've missed the half. No, I've got the half in, that's right. Uh, and now again, so this wedge product with, uh, with h, I can write it this way, and the wedge product with f, and remember I'm applying tor to this, and this is the Clifford multiplication by an x0, which is a, a unit vector in, the, in the, the trivial direction here. So here's what you can do, so you, for example, th this is the simplest uh, side, so the terms I have to add to this in order to get uh, zero torsion, there's a, there's a term which goes into here, which is minus, 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 there's a term here, so the minus minus zero, that in picks up f. There's a term here which is minus minus plus, so, which picks up the h but with a different factor, factor of third. Uh, and the other one is a bit more complicated, but you, you see the procedure that you have these, these pieces and you just put them into the, into the appropriate places in this uh, connection uh, in order to make the torsion zero. So once you've done that, uh, you can get a connection with zero torsion. It's not in fact unique, like the levi civita connection, but, uh, but never mind. Uh, uh, once you have a connection, then you have to ask the question of uh, what is the curvature. So again, the temptation is to, uh, is to imitate the definition of curvature in the usual sense, but using the current bracket. Here again it fails because of, the, uh, of this term here, but uh, if you restrict to directions u and v which are orthogonal, 
then the uh, embarrassing term here uh, disappears and so this then becomes tensorial. So for curvature we don't get a, a something in the Lie algebra with values in wedge 2 of E but we do get something with respect to this decomposition with values in V tensor V perpendicular. So, so there is a well-defined curvature for a generalized connection which takes values in here. So the question is, suppose I have my torsion-free connection which I've constructed here, uh, what is its curvature? Well, I'm not going to write that down, but uh, uh, the curvature depends on the choices that you make, in fact. Um, because I said that it wasn't uniquely determined. But what you can do are to look at Ricci contractions. And so in this case, there are actually two Ricci contractions. So our, our curvature tensor lies inside here, and I can evaluate the endomorphisms on V and get a contraction like this, or I can evaluate uh, this one on this and get such a contraction. So, um, so there are two Ricci tensors for this, uh, this kind of generalized connection. Uh, one of the, the nice features about this, which is well, you know, valid in ordinary generalized geometry, is that you can define uh, a, a generalized Ricci flow because once we define a generalized metric as a distinguished subbundle V of E, uh, then what is a, a tangent space to the space of generalized metrics? Well, you're just looking at the, it's like the tangent vector to a Grassmannian. It's homomorphisms from V into V perpendicular. And this is precisely where our generalized Ricci tensor lies. So without even looking at things, you can define a generalized Ricci flow uh, and, well, see what it is. But in concrete terms, uh, it's good to actually see what these uh, Ricci tensors are. And so I say there are two of them. So here's the first one. So this is where we do the contraction on the V. And this is on the n-dimensional piece. Uh, and then uh, this V tensor V perpendicular has different components. It turns out that in this case there's uh, the T star part, the, if you like the A field part, has, uh, has zero in it. In fact the, the curvature F doesn't appear in this at all. So th this, is, this is very much like uh, the situation of ordinary generalized geometry. So that Ricci curvature just gives you basically uh, the geometry of a connection with skewed torsion. Uh, if you look at the other one, then this is where the, uh, the, the, uh, the, the two form appears. And so now you do have, uh, so it appears in this, this situation, and also the, the, the A field uh, uh, contributes uh, a term which looks like this. So, and I should mention that this, this H here, as you see, it has opposite sign to this. Um, so what are, these, what are these equations? Well, they've appeared in, in, in other places, so these are virtually the simplest uh, cases of the... So setting these to zero, is the, uh, these are the equations of motion in heterotic supergravity with a, where you set the diloton to be equal to 1, and you have a U1 gauge field. So, so there's, some, there's clearly some link here with, uh, with heterotic uh, string theory, uh, but, uh, but all I'm saying is that what did, what did I do, what did I set out to do? I, I said let's, let's look at this SON plus 1N geometry, uh, look at it from the point of view of generalized geometry, turn the handle and see what you get. So, so this set of equations is one of the things that, that you naturally get. So what else there is in there, uh, uh, I don't know, but um, as I say, I'm working on this with my, with my student uh, Rubio. Okay, so I better finish that.